that we began a series that we're going to continue on through into Easter. And we're looking at the book of Job and just some of the great truths that the book tells us, that teaches us. And we remember from last week the, the question, or the, the great question of the book of Job. You know, a lot of folks, when they ask, what is the book of Job about? First thing they say, suffering. And Job does suffer. I mean, we see a lot of suffering. That, but that's really not the question of the book of Job. The question is, who do I worship? And why? When we look at that in, 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 in this whole book, well, we have to ask ourselves that question. Who do we worship and why? As we remember in chapter 1, we saw Job worship God. And we see you know, that the, 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 he, he was worshiping God and, 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 and he did, did everything because he loved God. You know, he was making sacrifices on behalf of his kids and he was calling out to God. He was saying, perhaps, perhaps they've sinned in their heart. Lord, I, I, I want to I pray for them. And, and he, he, he spent his time worshiping God. But if you remember chapter 1, I'm going to say Satan comes in and, and Satan says, you know, he, he had everything under control. God says, well, have you thought about Job? You know, Job, he, he, he worships me. He's perfect. He's upright. He, he fears me. He, he excuses evil. And, and Satan says, well, yeah, I thought about Job. But God, I can't touch him. You've got such a hedge around him. You, you've got such a relationship with him. I can't touch him. And, and Satan accused God. He said, you know, you've got such a relationship with Job. And, and it's a mixed up relationship, God. And it's one, you, you, you give it, you bless him. So he worships you. He worships you, so you bless him more. And if you remember, Job was rich than lost. You know, so Satan says, the only reason he's worshiping you is because you can give him things. He's kind of like my boss that bought us the Dr. Pepper. You know, we work our tails off for that man. Because every once in a while, he buys Dr. Pepper. So Satan says, for Job, it was the same thing. So, so Satan says, you strip that away from him. You quit blessing him. Let me take, a, or take away his blessings. And he will curse you. He will curse you in your face. You know what God did? God says, okay, test it. He's saying, you can do whatever you want to. Just don't touch his life. Don't touch him. Don't touch him. Do you take away anything? I mean, Job lost everything. He was richly blessed. He had all kinds of possessions. You remember he had sheep and he had camels and, and, and oxen and, and donkeys and, and all kinds of things. He had servants. Lost all those. He had ten children, seven sons, three daughters. Lost all those. Satan took all that away. And he still worshipped God. You know, after having everything stripped away, look back in, into chapter 1, verse 20. It says, Then Job arose and rent his mouth and, and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Even after everything was stripped away, he worshipped. And it left us with the question, there will be a day in our life, it might be while well upon this earth, it might be later, but everything's going to be stripped away. And it's going to leave us with that question, who do we worship? For Job, the answer is God. So with that question in our minds, who do we worship and why? We need to move into chapter 2. So, so, so let's start there. And as we see, move into chapter 2, we're going to see a couple things. And I'm going to see them better because then I have my glasses. First thing we're going to see is we're going to see Satan returns. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, and there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that fears God and is accused evil? As we look at that, you know, what we kind of, you know, Satan's come back. And, and here's a second meeting with God. Now, it's probably not the second. He's probably met with God many times. But for this story, it's the second meeting with God. 
And it comes along, and as we look at Satan's return, we're going to see some things here. And he comes in, and he says, you know, there's a lot about the heavenlies I don't understand. There's a lot about the spiritual realm I don't understand. This is one of them. You know, I know that the Satan fell in sin. Our Bible tells us that. But here, he, he's, when the sons of God come before uh, Almighty God, it says, you know, Satan came too. I don't understand that. But, but that's not the point that we need to see. We need to see that he did come before God. And when he did, God says, what you been doing? Where have you been at? You know, Satan, where'd you come from? What'd you do there? Satan says, well, well I've been ruling. I've been going to and fro about the earth. And, and if you remember from Scripture, you know, God is a Satan is the prince and the power of this earth. And he said, I've been ruling my place. I'm large and in charge. I've been taking care of my stuff in my place. And, and, and I, I've been doing it, God. I've been there. But look what God's response is. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Now, if you were here last week, you're thinking, man, this sounds really familiar. Because basically, these first three verses is exactly what we read in chapter 1. Satan comes before God and says, you know, I've been ruling. I'm large and in charge. And God says, have you thought about Job? Job lives in your place. And Job don't follow you. You're not ruling Job. But, but Satan says, you strip everything away. Well, now he's been stripped. He's lost all his possessions. He's lost his servants. He's lost his kids. And we saw that Job still worshiped God. So when Satan comes back, and he says, you know, I've been rolling my place. God says, uh-oh, what about Job? Hey, have, you, have you considered my servant Job? Have you, uh, have you thought about him? He still lives in your place. And Satan you haven't been ruled him. Job's a man of integrity. Job fears me. Job stays away from evil. And he lives in your place. But God adds something else here. At the end of verse 4, it says, or verse 3, and he still holds fast to integrity. Although Thou moved me against him to destroy him without cause. He says, even though you convinced me to, to let you strip everything away, I had no reason to be worship me anyway. I knew everything. But you convinced me. So because of that, he still worshiped me. See? He lives in your place. He lives in that place that you claim to be ruling. But yet Job still worships me. Now when we think about it, when we get to that point in the story, what should have happened at that time? You know, God has pointed out to Satan again that he is not ruling everybody. Everybody is not following him. Job lives in his territory. Job lives in his place. And Job hasn't worshipped him. Job has, you know, at that point in time, Satan should have said, yeah, you've got me, God. You're right, Job lives there, and he's not following me. He's sure following you. I took everything away from him. I, you'd have never, I've never guessed it. But he worshiped you still. Job just loves you. He worships you. God, I, I can't touch you. That should have been what happened. But that's not what happened. You know, it should have been that time when Satan said, God, I'm sorry, I misjudged Job. Man, he, he follows you no matter what. I'm sorry. I was wrong. But that's not what Satan did. As we go on into this story, we see more of Satan's character. Let's go into verse 4. It says, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man has will he give for his life. Satan should have said, you know, you're right, God. You, you, you're right, you're always right. Job did worship me, or worship you. He didn't worship me. He, he fell down and worshiped you, even though, but, but, but Satan came up with something else. And as we look at Satan's character, throughout the book of Job, we see more about Satan than we do about Job. Because it shows us a lot about who Satan really is. And one of the things we see in this character here is Satan is full of excuses. 
Satan is, is, is a person of excuses. You know, and his excuse was, God, you're right. I took everything away, but, but I know what's happening. You have such a mixed up relationship. You was giving him stuff. You were blessing him. So he worshipped you. He worshipped you. So you blessed him more. And, and we took it away. And, and, and I thought that could have done it. But I know what's going on here. A man will do anything to save his life. Skin for skin. He would have traded it all as long as he could live. And God somehow, you, you must have went to him. You must have let him know that, that uh, you know, it's going to hurt. It's going to be bad. And it's, everything's going to be taken away. But the joke, you're going to be okay through it all. Through this mixed up relationship that you have, Satan's starting with excuses. You know, he would have done anything just to save his life. You know, and basically what Satan's saying or what we're seeing in his character is that he's saying, Job would trade the skin of his children just to save his own hide. Skin for skin. Now every parent in place is probably about ready to scream about now. Because you're thinking, I would do anything for my kids not to be hurt. I would do anything to protect my kids. You know, I remember times when my kids were, were younger and they get sick. And I'd be crying out to God and go, God, it'll make me sick so that they don't feel this way. Because we would do anything. But here's Satan with his excuses saying, oh, I know what's going on. Yeah, you're right, Job worshiped you, but, but he's not skin for skin. He'd do anything to save his life. If he thought it still meant that he's going to live, he'd worship you. And he's coming up with his excuses. In Satan's eye. Wasn't Satan's fault. Wasn't anything wrong with him. He was just saying, there's excuses. And he's coming up with that. You know, and, and I think about that. And I think the reason he, the reason he said that Job's not following him, some kind of excuse. Now I wonder where we get it from. Because you know, sometimes we're really good at making excuses. When it comes to serving God, Job should have said, "Yeah, I'm sorry." I, I, Job worships you, or Satan should have said, "I'm sorry." Job worships you, but said he tries to make it God's fault. You know, and here's what it does: when he tries to make it God's fault with his excuses, it shows another part of Job's characteristics: his depravity. The depravity, you know, total depravity is absolutely positively nothing good whatsoever. There's absolutely nothing good in Satan, and he's showing it here. He's showing his depravity because he said, you know, because of the excuses he's making. Instead of just fasting out and saying, God, there's one who worships you. They don't all worship me. He starts with it. He's showing there's absolutely nothing good in himself. You know, and I think about that, and I think about how Satan makes the excuses. I think of how many times you and I make excuses. Over the work of God. You know, over what God's doing. You know, we'll see God working around us. But, but, but we didn't care to go. We hadn't prayed. We didn't give. We didn't worship. So, so we start making up excuses. Well, it won't last. You know, see the church grow, well, it's going to fall. We see somebody growing no more, we'll just give them a year or two. We start coming up with the excuses. Just like Satan does. You know, and we start with those excuses and, and we continue just bringing them on because we're trying to make ourselves look better and it doesn't matter what the cost. Here as we look at Satan's character, Satan is one of excuses and it shows that he is totally depraved. But you know, Satan's not done. As we go into the next few verses, we're going to see Satan's attack. God, he would trade, he, if it meant save his life, he'd have traded it all. He'd have gave it all. He, he did, if it meant he could live and he'd be okay, he didn't care about those kids. That's just how Job operates. I know, I know people. Skin for skin, he says. So then he says, in verse 5, Put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you. To your face. God, you hurt him and he'll curse you. You go against him and he will curse you to your face. Satan seems mighty sure of himself. He says, Oh, it's skin for skin. Hey, he didn't care as long as it saved his life, but you hurt him, 
He will surely curse you then. You know what happens next? Verse 6, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in thy hand. Just save his life. You want to hurt him? You've already taken everything away. He's still worshiping me. You want to hurt him? Do anything you want to him. Just don't take his life. You know, last week I told you, when, 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 when Satan comes about, he says, I've been ruining my game. I've been in charge of my territory. The place that I have, I'm under control. God says, have you thought about Job? And my thought was, if God ever thinks about doing that to me, don't. I, I don't know that I want that. You know, I, 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 I don't want to voluntarily have to prove my faith. You know, I've often wondered in the day and time we live. There's a whole lot of folks out to get Christians. There's a whole lot of folks that want to shut down churches. You know, what if somebody at some point in time in your life would put a gun to your head and say, you know, either you curse God or I'll pull the trigger. We can kind of relate to, to what Satan's doing here. And he, he says... Job's still worshipped. But God tells Satan, go ahead. Just don't take his life. Do whatever you want to. And the next two verses shows us what Satan does. Verse 7. <coughs> so Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job, Job with sores, boils, from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a pot shirt to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Job comes, or, or Satan comes, and he does everything to Job. Now, we have to remember something. Job is not reading this story in 2017 in Old Fields. Job doesn't know the end of the story. And maybe you're not familiar with the end of Job's story. We'll get to it in a few weeks, but I'll give you a preview. At the end of the story, God's going to restore back double everything he had. He's going to have ten more kids. You know, and, and everything's going to be restored back to Job in his relationship with God. His health's going to come back and everything. You know, but Job doesn't know that. All of a sudden, Job, you know, he's already lost everything. All of his possessions, gone. All of his servants, gone. All of his kids, gone. And now he's stricken with some kind of disease that's not getting any better. It's to the point where to, the only relief he can find is he's sitting in the middle of the trash dump with a piece of broken pottery scraping his sores. That's the only, that's how bad he is. Job thinks he's going to die. Everything else has been taken away and now Job's thinking, I'm going to die. He don't know the end of the story like we do. He's living it. So as we start to, to look and start to unfold everything, you know, we see that Satan has attacked him. And then not only taken away everything, but, but Job is suffering. And you know, there's something that I've learned about suffering. You have to do it alone. When you're suffering, you're alone. Now, I, I mean, I like to bring as many people into my suffering as I can. You know, when I'm sick, and I'll, I'll let you in a little secret about your pastor. When I'm sick, I mean, I'm not talking like death. Say, I'm just sick. I am the biggest baby on the face of the earth. I'm not big old macho man. I am a wimp when I'm sick. And I, I know all you wives are pointing your husbands going, he is too. Most men are. But, but I, I'm probably the worst. I'm the biggest baby when I'm sick. And I want to bring everybody else into my suffering. Honey, would you fix me something good to eat to make me feel a little better? I'd like some soup or a piece of toast. Baby, could you bring me a cracker? I, I want to involve you know, kids. Could, could you just rub right here? I want her, it would make it feel so much better. We, we, we want to bring, but you know, here's the thing. We suffer alone. When it comes to suffering, nobody can lessen that. Nobody can really take that away. And when it comes to suffering, Job is suffering. He's sitting in the trash pile with pieces of broken pottery trying to, to, to give himself a little bit of relief from the suffering that he's in. Now, from this point on in the story, almost the entire rest of this book is unpacking Job's suffering. 
It's given us a good look at Job and the suffering and how he endures that and what all takes place. And we're going to see next week the advice that he gets from his friends. But when we look at it, we all realize we suffer as well. You and I, in our all, we may not be sitting in the trash dump with boils from head to toe, scraping ourselves apart. But you know what? As humans, we suffer. And as we answer, remember the question? Who do we worship and why? All this suffering, the whole book of Job, what it's going to prove is who Job worships. So in our suffering, we have to ask ourselves, who do we worship? So as we unpack all the rest of this book, we're going to be looking at that question. Who do we worship? Who do we worship when things go from bad to worse? And to do that, we have to go on in the story. To do that, to answer that question, who do we worship and why? We have to look at our view of worship. What is worship to us? Because here's the thing that I find. You know, when we, we come together for the holy hour of church from 11 to 12, we call that worship. So for a lot of folks, when they think worship, it's an hour a week. That's what worship is. You know, a lot of folks, to, to worship is the singing. To some, worship is the preaching. To others, worship is the praying. You know, some, to some, worship is all of it put together. You know, but we have to look at what is our view of worship. Because let's face it, in a crowd the size of what we have here this morning, I'm going to guess there's probably folks that worship for them is taking up their space in the pew. They came, they stayed, they leave, they worshiped. There's others that, that to them, their view of worship was the songs we sang. I liked one, I didn't like one, so I half worship today. We have to look, if we're going to see who do we worship, we have to look because we have to know our view of worship. And in the next two verses, we're going to see two entirely different views of worship. We're going to see the, the view uh, of the next character that we're going to be introduced to. In verse 9, we're going to be introduced to Job's wife. And we're going to be able to see her view of worship. So, so as we look at our view, number one, we're going to see her view. Let's go ahead and read verse 9. Then said his wife unto him, well, this is the first time we've met her. Then says his wife unto him, Dost thou not retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. So what she, she, she are you just going to act like this forever? Her view of worship is God owes us something. She's looking at him and she's saying, God owes me something. Back when things was going good, when God was blessing, when we had stuff, when we had kids, when we had possession, when we had animals, everything was going good, we worshiped God. You know, God gave us that, we worshiped Him. But now we don't have that anymore. Why do we worship? So her view is God owes us something to set up something. You know, a lot of times for us, we get that same attitude. Our view of worship is I worship because God owes me something. I'm here to make God feel good. And when I make Him feel good, He makes me feel good. He owes that to me. God will bless me because I was in His house today. The preacher will shake my hand when I leave, so I'll be blessed. You know, and we think of that because we think God owes us something. And then once we start that, we start getting the mindset of Job's wife. Now, now look here. Out comes this woman. First time we're introduced to her. And all of a sudden, she says, Do you still hang on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Folks, I want to tell you, what a joy this woman is. <laughs> I mean, I, can you just imagine Job sitting there in the trash dump with his broken pottery, scraping his balls, thinking back to his wedding night and going, I'm so glad I married her. <laughs> Such a wonderful wife she is. Just curse God and get it over with. Curse God and die. But I tell you, it does answer one question. 
Well, a question that we could have had from last week. You know, but when, the, when Satan's taking everything away and he takes all the possessions and he takes all the servants and he kills all the kids, and we wonder why didn't he kill his wife? I, I can just see it. You know, the demon is going, hey, we're going after kids. You want us to just get the wife too? Satan goes, nah, we're going to need her next week. <laughs> She's more on our side than his. Curse God and die, she says. But what she showed us is her view of worship. God owes me something. And, you know, and here's the thing as we break that down, but we take it a little more. She said there, do you still retain your integrity? Just curse God and die. With that mindset of worship that God owes us something, let's break down a little bit what she's thinking. In her view, she says we're able to evaluate God. In her view of worship, saying that, that God owes us something, what she's actually doing is she's evaluating God. She's put God to the test. And she said, if God's blessing, then I need to worship Him. But if God's not blessing, then I don't need to worship Him. You know, God's done good things for me, so I'm going to worship Him. But God's taken everything away, so I don't need to. What she's doing is she's placing an evaluation on God. As long as the stuff was rolling in, oh, Job, worship God all you want. But now it's been taken away. Just curse God and get it over with. Because her view is we're able to evaluate God. She's telling Job that in his little piece of the world, in all his knowledge of his years, he should be able to evaluate the God of the universe. Just curse him and die. God owes you something. He's not given. So it takes it a step farther. If we believe that we're able to evaluate God, then the next thing we see is, is it leads us to another thought that God should be graded. And if God's graded, it's on a pass-fail system. And the, the second thought, if we're able to evaluate God, then we should be able to grade God. We look at the gifts He gives, He passes. Long as Job was blessed, he had livestock, he had servants, he had all these kids, you know, God gets a thumbs up. But what she's saying is the moment that it's going, just give him the boot. He fails. And you know, when we think that worship is all about what we get, what God does for us because He owes it to us, then we're judging God. We're, we're trying to grade Him. We're trying to put Him on, on a pass-fail system. And you know, it takes us to the third thing that I thought of her worship. If God fails then you don't need him. If God's failed, if you've judged God and he's failed, then get rid of him. So she comes out, she says, are you still going to hang on to your integrity? Just curse God and die. Now I know every person in the place this morning is sitting here thinking, what a woman. I would never do that. I would never judge God. I would never try to evaluate God. I, I'm not going to look at it in the way she does. I don't think that God owes me something. But you know the truth is, if we're going to be honest with one another, we probably think that a whole lot more than we actually realize we do. When we get the idea that worship is God owing us something. Oh, I'm not going to evaluate God. I'm not going to judge Him. I'm not going to say whether God passes or fails. But I just got my feelings hurt in church, so I'm never going back. <laughs> that preacher preached on my relationship with God, and it wasn't mine, so I'm not going to listen to him anymore. Oh, but I'm not going to judge God. He don't know me anything. Somebody walked right by me and didn't even say hello in service today. I'm going to be mad at him for the rest of my life. But I'm not going to judge God. You know, often we get this idea that God owes us something. God owes us that during our holy hour, we sing only our favorite song to our favorite tempo, at our favorite beat, with our favorite musicians, we read our favorite scriptures, we preach in our favorite method, we pray to our liking, or just let us do it that way, it's even better that way. Because we come to church, so we deserve that. Somebody told me one time, Says, Pastor, did you realize the time when you finished? I said, No, I really didn't. 
I'm, I, my philosophy is, you preach, you're done. And I said, well, this person reminded me. It was after 12 when you got done. Shame on me. I said, well, you know, I thought it was a very important sermon. God laid it on my heart. I was just delivered. But you need to be remindful that if we're going to come to church, you need to honor us and be done within the hour. You know what we're thinking? God owes us something. If I'm going to show up, the songs are going to be fast and peppy and the sermon's going to be short. God owes that to me. We get that idea. And you know what we're doing? We're evaluating God. God's let me down. Some time ago, the, the messages that God laid on my heart to preach from His Word was things about things we face in the lives we live. So we looked at some of those unpopular topics. We looked at abortion. We looked at homosexuality. We looked at gambling. And one Sunday we looked at alcohol. And, and I was very careful not at any point in time to say this is what I think. Everything that I presented in, in the lesson that morning was exactly, you know, this is what the Word of God says and read straight from the Bible. I, I didn't add to it, I didn't take away. This is what the Word of God says. Church was over. Man, we had two regroup sessions in the parking lot. I, I, I heard about one of them. That preacher can't tell me I can't drink. You know what? I heard there's a church up the road that they don't frown on drinking. Matter of fact, the pastor thinks it's okay. I'm just going to leave it there to that church. Her view of worship, Job's wife, God owes me something. And if it's not to my liking, then God fails. What's our view of worship? But I told you there's two views. And for the second view, we have to go to verse 10. And there we see Job's view of worship. In verse 10 it says, But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speak. I wouldn't recommend that at home. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you disagree with your wife, do not go, you sound like a foolish woman. <laughs> but in Job's day and culture, he did. He says, but you speak like the foolish woman speak. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall we not receive evil? Job's view of worship was a whole lot different than hers. When Job looked at worship, he says, God is God in the good times and the bad. Job's whole view of worship, whether it's the good times or whether it's the bad times, whether I'm the most blessed man in the territory or whether I'm sitting in a trash dump Scraping my sores to pottery. God's still God. He recognized that God was God. And if he was going to accept the good things that come from God, then he was going to accept the bad things as well. You know, I think for you and I, we have to know that God is still God. Do you remember the question of the book of Job? It's not how much you're going to suffer. The question of the book of Job is who do you worship? And why? We've seen in Job's life things went from bad the worse. So we have to ask the question, who do we worship and why? Maybe this morning, as you let God evaluate your life, you find out that you've only been worshiping the God who gives. As long as there's blessings, you worship. But the moment there's no blessings, you're ready to dump God. Oh, if you get good things from church, you'll be here.
But if things don't go your way, I'm out of here. You know, years ago, many years ago now, I had a woman who made the comment, broadcasted it publicly, so some of you probably heard it. The next Sunday after that man's gone, I'll be back in church. That's probably been 13, 14 years ago. She's never come back. But the next Sunday after I leave, you know why? I showed her something in God's Word. I followed God's will. And she didn't like it. She got mad. She evaluated God and said, I don't need you. In our view of worship, are we only here for what we get? But we're out here if we know to sing my favorite song. If a preacher don't speak to me at some point in time today, I'll never talk to him again. How dare he stand up there with a microphone in his hand and insinuate that I could be worshiping for what I want. Maybe as we evaluate our worship, we see that we worship only the God who gives. Well, folks, there is a day there is a day when everything will be stripped away. And the only question to remain is who do we worship? Maybe right now in your life, you feel like there's been a whole lot of stripping done. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's pain. Maybe it's possessions. Who do you worship? <clears throat> Maybe you're here and you're thinking right now things is going good. My friends, there's a day coming. Who do you worship? Are we only worshiping the God of gives? Or are we worshiping the God of Job? Who is God? He's God in the good time. And he's God in the bad. Here's where I want to leave you this morning. I want to ask you to look at your own life. Now we're not going to ask for a show of hands. We're not, we're not, I'm not going to ask for any kind of, uh, of response that's visible to anybody else. But I want you, just you and God, to look at your life right now. Your spiritual life, your spiritual walk. And I want you to imagine if everything, everything was stripped away, would you be worshiping God? What does God want to do in your life this morning? How does He want to draw you closer to Him? Maybe this morning you realize hey, there's sin in my life. There's things that I've raised up that they shouldn't be there. I want to ask God to forgive me. Maybe this morning there's burdens. There's things that you're thinking, I, I just don't know how to handle this. And you just need to give them to God. Maybe this morning it's your worship. And you need to confess that sin of only worshiping a God who gives. And turn to worship God. Maybe this morning you're in the middle of that bad time. And you feel like everything has already been stripped away. Will you give that to God as well? Maybe this morning for the first time. You've realized there's a God who loves you so much. That he sent his son to pay the price of your sin. And you can accept His free gift of eternal life. I don't know what God's laid on your heart. But I do know this. 
When things go from bad to worse, we have to know who we worship and why. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I would pray for every person that's here. Lord, as you speak to our hearts, I pray God that we'll respond. Lord, maybe there's folks here that you're working in your heart right now. And they're wondering if everything was stripped away, who would I worship? I pray to God that they will turn to you and they'll worship you. Lord, we surrender our to you. We ask you to have your way in our lives right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing.